Excellent. Okay, we've got people joining. Just gonna give it a few minutes while I'm managing the waiting room. We've got people joining now. So if you're joining, just please make sure that you're, um, that you're muted. We would appreciate that so that we can limit any background noise um, and we will get started momentarily. Maybe as people are coming in, they could tell us where their first names and where they're from. That's a great right. idea. If you all don't mind giving us a little info of where you're tuning in from today, that would be wonderful. You can just enter that into the chat, chat log. Um, and we will be, and you can also, if you've already got questions that you, you want answered, please feel free to, to go ahead and start putting your questions in the chat log. I'm just gonna give it one more minute for those of you that are still joining, um, just want people to mute their mics, looks like you are. Um, and if you could go ahead and just introduce yourself and let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat log, we'd love to, love to know. Last week's call, we had somebody from Sweden, which was super cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right, California, love that. Oh yeah, you eat good year round in California. <laughs> really good options, <laughs> or let's say a large variety of options. All right, it looks like the, the waiting room is slowing down a little bit. Um, oh, yeah. Welcome everyone. I'm gonna keep monitoring the, the waiting room and working behind the scenes here. I just wanna uh, welcome you all. My name is Liz Wiley. I'm the executive director of the Marion Institute. And uh, we are loving our 21 day Renew You Challenge. How are you all liking it? Can I get a thumbs up or if you have any questions about the 21 day Renew You Challenge, feel free to enter it into the, I love that Bernadette, feel free to enter that into any of your questions. So even if they're not related to today, if you have questions about any of the um, topics that have been covered over the past week, feel free to also enter your questions in. If we can't answer them, we're happy to send them to the appropriate person. Um, whether that's Dr. Tom or Julie Tom, some of the other uh, folks that you have met, um, and we'll get an answer for you. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to uh, continue to sort of work behind the scenes and manage some of these questions and stuff. I'm going to turn things over to my, my teammate on here, Katie Mannix, who has been the master behind the scenes of creating all the content that you guys are seeing and getting every day. So she gets full full credit um, and my other teammate, Patty Rigo on here that has also been working endlessly to assist this process. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on over to, to Katie. Thank you all. Awesome, thanks Liz and welcome. We're so glad you're with us. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have ever sat down and intentionally had a conversation about eating local foods. Um, so I'm very excited to join you today. It's certainly my first time, and I'm extremely glad to be able to introduce Karen Schwab from uh, CMAP. She's executive director of that organization, and she is going to share her wisdom with us and take her time uh, this afternoon helping to educate and inform uh, the way that we buy our food. So without further ado, I'm going to further hand it over to Karen and once again say thank you for being with us, Karen. Ah, thank you, Katie and Liz, both, and Patty, uh, for the invitation to talk about local food. It's my favorite thing to talk about, which is good because it is what I do um, for a living and most of the day. Um, CMAP is what is called a bi-local organization. Um, and I'm going to kind of take you through um, probably, you know, obviously from an American perspective um, and a Northeast perspective on local food. Um, there, I saw someone is here from Estonia. 
Uh, some of this will make sense to you. Some of it might be a little bit different. Um, and of course, seasonally, California and Florida on the list. So you'll be um, able to extrapolate from some things. And I can answer some non-regional questions as well, if need be. Um, so CMAP, um, you can go right to the next slide, is, um, oh, sorry. And then this is kind of what we're going to cover in the course of the next half hour or so. Um, looking at um, why local, different ways to buy local, and then to kind of touch on organic. Um, next slide. So CMAP is a buy local organization. Um, they exist in different formats across the country. Uh, Massachusetts happens to have a hyper local buy local program where there are nine organizations across the state um, covering different counties. And CMAP covers Bristol, Plymouth, and Norfolk County, which is outside of Boston, kind of south of 495 to the Rhode Island line, and then all the way down to the bridge. We cover about a quarter of the state's municipalities. And so uh, working with a lot of small farmers um, on very diversified operations. So everything from you know, the backyard farmer selling, um, a, you know, in a little farm stand on the street or even a card table to, um, you know, 100 acre, 150 acre farms serving everything from wholesale to farm stands to farmers markets. Uh, next slide, please. So why local? Um, there's a lot of good reasons to buy local. You see them um, in on posters, in marketing materials. Um, you get with a local food um, fresh right from the um, from the farm food. It's got um, you know very little time in refrigeration, very little time anywhere but you know from the field to the farm stand to your to your bag, to your refrigerator, to your counter, wherever you want to keep it. So you're getting fresher food. Uh, with better flavor and more nutrition. In most cases, um, food that is shipped um, loses nutrients in transport. It just sits too long. And even if it looks good, it's already starting to break down. Uh, local food is coming right from the farm to you um, and you get the best benefit of um, you know, the flavor, the nutrition and What's exciting I have found with Northeast farmers is they love to grow different varieties. They wanna try something new. So you're going to see varieties you would not see in the supermarket. You're gonna see tiny carrots, fat carrots, multicolored carrots. And granted supermarkets have gotten better than when I was a child where we had four tomatoes in a cellophane pack and an iceberg lettuce um, and everything else came in canned. Um, but you know, the farmers now are experimenting, they're developing seeds that are appropriate to the region um, and working with um, their, con their consumers, their customers to see what is, um, what are types of crops they want to grow or see. So you get to actually have a better variety in your, from working directly with your local farmer. Um, next slide, please. Um, local also has the, um, a, a great benefit in your knowing your farmer, you're knowing your neighbor, and you're able to talk to the person who grows your food, or maybe one step removed, you're talking to somebody who is um, working with the person who grows your food. Not all the farmer's not always the one who comes to the farmer's market, but they're super knowledgeable about what is being grown and how it's being grown. And I think for all of us on this call, that's something we care about, making sure that the not only is the food healthy for us but the food's healthy for the planet as well. Um, and for some of us, it's also the, you know, that a farmer is getting fair compensation for the food. The way our food system works is, ex there's a lot of disparity in, you know, who is making the money in the food system. So in this case, the farmer gets a bigger portion of, of the food that he grows as, you know, goes back into his own pocket, which in turn keeps that money in our local economy. There's lots of metrics that people measure, but you know what I have seen is for every dollar you spend at a farmer's market or a local farmer's farm business, it recycles 11 times in your local community as opposed to spending it at a, far, at a uh, supermarket where it basically leaves your local economy. Next slide. 
Um, and there's also just the importance of maintaining um, an agricultural landscape for a lot of people. Um, the rural landscapes, the open fields, it has, you know, a historical value, it has a huge ecological value. One of the most quickly disappearing um, ecosystems is just those open fields. So being able to keep um, keep uh, open landscapes, vistas that are traditional and um, you know well loved in our region, farmland is part of in New England is part of our history. Um, next slide. So. Um, Yeah, that's a good, yeah, Liz is bringing up a good point here. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I'll get, yeah, I'll kind of loop back to that afterward. Um, did I, just a second. Um, yeah, so one of the big questions that I get working with local food is, is it organic? Or there's an assumption that everything is organic. Um, that's not always the case. There are certainly farmers who are working organic and organic comes with a whole different conversation we'll get to in a minute. But really when it comes down to wanting to know how healthy your food is, nothing beats talking to your farmer. Um, being able to go into the farm stand, go into um, you know different any different ways you buy local food, you're getting a chance to learn more about what you're eating. Um, and I, kind of put these two points underneath it when you're talking to your farmer. Um, sometimes people get a little confrontational when they don't hear what they expect. You know, it's not organic. Well, what do you mean it's not organic? Um, ask, go in with an open mind and ask questions and develop a relationship with your farmer and you're gonna learn a whole bunch about your food. And, you know, developing that rapport will give you a chance to um, potentially adjust how your farmer is, you know, what they're growing or how they're growing. So. Not everything is organic. It's yeah, it's local, it's fresh, um, it's flavorful, but and and run by and and managed at a human scale. Um, so next slide, please, Katie. This is what organic means now. Um, organic is trademarked, and it is a marketing designation as much as it is a growing, um, a set of growing practices. So when you buy something organic, you are in some instances supporting this. If you're buying organic in a big store, a box store market, um, and it doesn't always meet the standards that we used to expect from organic. So um, next slide, Katie. So there's the trademarked organic. It's managed by the USDA. Um, it is a fairly rigorous set of criteria that a farm has to meet, but it's also targeted at large scale farms. You cannot use the word organic anymore unless it is you have gone through the trademarking marketing trademark program, except if you're a small farm and it's around $5,000 where there's a small farm exemption and you have, you can say you're meeting the practices, but you don't have to jump through all of the hoops. Um, there are great organic farms. There are a lot of farms that do um, have the time and energy to go through the marketing criteria and through the program that the USD has. USDA has, and they are doing great work, but they are not the only game in town. There's also organically grown, which is where you're making a personal commitment to growing by organic methods, which are, you know, plant-based earth-friendly methods, but you're not going through the trademarking program. Um, there is a different certification called Certified Naturally Grown, which has a set of environmental standards that are more suited to the small farmer. Um, my favorite is the one right now they're using in New York, which is the Farmer's Pledge. And that is benefiting not just local healthy food, but also strong local economies, fair working conditions, better wages, um, humane treatment of animals and care of the land. So that is managed through NOFA New York. It's, uh, it's used in other places, not as well known, but uh, from my mind, 
it covers all of the bases that I think most of us are looking for. There's also a food justice certification you can get on top of organic. And that is also um, you know, another way to look at your food, not just the technical aspects of how it's grown, but how, how it is in an environmental justice um, situation. And as we go through organic, there is something that I think, you know, some of us may have talked more about, and that's nutrient dense crops or nutrient density. And that is the attempt not just to grow food that is, um, how do I want to say this, um, good for the planet and safe, but also food that has more nutrition in it than you would nor find in normal crops. And there's a lot of layers to that. That's probably its own conversation, but food that has been grown in land that is constantly in production, unless you are paying very good attention, you can deplete your soil of certain nutrients. Um, what nutrient dense farming does is makes a very active and um, deliberate attempt to increase the density of nutrients in the food itself. And so they are managing their soils differently and they're managing their crops differently with um, somewhat of a, a different approach than just an organic farm or an organically grown crop would. Um, the one, there are a few in the South Coast that are doing that. Um, I think the king of that is Brooks Bounty Farm and Derek Christensen. He sometimes um, will do workshops on that, but his website for Bricks Bounty Farm, B-R-I-X, Bounty, um, and we'll, I'll get this to Patty so you guys can have that as a follow-up, um, talks a lot about um, the health benefits of having more nutrient-dense foods. So next slide, please. So how do you get more local food in your diets? You got to find your farmers, um, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, through a community supported agriculture. Right now our winter farmers markets, and there's also an aspect of online ordering for pickup and delivery. And I'm gonna cover all those points in the next few slides. So next slide, Katie. So um, community supported agriculture is about 25 years old and it is has reshaped the way farmers interact with their customers. So, um, I put up kind of the technical de definition, you know, um, you as a part of a community supported agriculture become a, a shareholder in a crop, the crop of the farm. Um, the best analogy I've seen is it's like a magazine subscription. You buy your magazine at the beginning of the year and you get regular installments. Um, in the case of a community supported agriculture, you pay up front for your food for the season. Um, and what you get back is, is food across, usually on a weekly basis, you get what is fresh and ripe and ready to go um, on the farm. And you get to come to the farm, meet your farm. I'd say most cases you come to the farm to pick up your food. In some cases, farmers are doing delivery either to households or at other locations. Sometimes health centers will put together a community supported agriculture um, or a, a business or um, even picking up at a farmer's market, they'll bring shares, boxes to their customers so who, instead of coming out to the farm. So you pay for the season, you get your weekly pickup of veggies, um, you get things you would expect, and they usually advertise what you would expect to get, root crops, leaf crops, fruits, sometimes herbs and flowers. Um, community supported agriculture also, some of the farms give you an opportunity to work right on the farm. You can come in and either do it as a something as a pleasure um, to come in and be able to help out the farmer and learn about farming. Sometimes they do a partial work share. So if you want to cut down the cost of you know the local food, you can um, go and help out on the farm. Some farms will say, all right, you know, you're coming to the farm and we are providing, you know, fruits, vegetables, um, leafy greens, but if you want to pick your own flowers, you can also do that as part of your share or pick your own herbs. So they make, you know, you have an opportunity to get more for your share just by coming to the farm and getting just what you need for that. This system works really well because it shares both the bounty and the risk because the, you are in it with the farmer as a shareholder on the farm. If it's a good year and, you know, there's a lot of good years in the Northeast, we have pretty good growing conditions. 
um, you can, you know, you will get a, sh a your portion of that share. In a good year, it's better, but in a bad year, you're going to take some of the risks. So you might have crop failure on spinach, and you're going to be getting chard and kale instead. But you're supporting the farmer. You're still getting, uh, you know, your value in vegetables, but it sh it spreads around the risk of. Um, of maintaining the farm and supporting the farm with the community as well as the farmer. And then just how the timing of community supported agriculture works is you pay the farmer ahead of time and that helps them at the beginning of the season when money is tight and that gets the farm up and going for the year. Next slide please Katie. Uh, winter farmers markets which is what we're seeing right now. Um, it's there's some really great farmers markets going on in in New England right now. Um, you're gonna get some amazing storage crops, apples, potatoes, onions, you know, beets, turnips. Um, it's been, it was a good year and there's a lot still for sale. You also see greenhouse and hydroponic greens and herbs, meat and eggs, and in some cases, dairy products. There's a lot of great cheese makers in the region. And then prepared foods that are coming, you know, that have been, um, created, you know, at a, was it produced at a time when the, everything was fresh and ready to go. So tomato sauce or dried herbs. So all available, you know, year round in this region. Um, since there, everyone is coming from so many different places, we're going to share some resources afterwards, but um, all the buy locals in Massachusetts have um, yeah, you know, websites where you can find out where there's local food. Massachusetts has its mass grown map, which is fairly up to date on which farms are still open, but better to call first with that. Farm Fresh Rhode Island does a great job in supporting it. Um, and then, you know, across the state, you'll be able to find either through your Department of Ag or through, um, you know, some of the, just a quick Google search, what is going, you know, what kind of farmers markets are going on in your region. And I can see Patty's putting some links into the chat for you. That's great. Um, so you're not always going to see everything you want, but the farmers are going to be able to help you find what you need. And um, there's still some amazing vegetables, some you might not be familiar with. Um, and that's, uh, you know, a lot of health and nutritious, healthy and nutritious food is still being produced in, in New England right now. Next slide, please. Um, this is a new and exciting option picking up for uh, buying online for pickup or delivery. And you can go right to the next slide, um, Katie. Um, this is somewhat of a COVID response. Um, and farmers, I'll say a good proportion of the farmers are. Um, they're pretty set in their ways. They know what works and they know what they like and they're very busy and they don't always try new and different things. But one thing COVID has forced farmers to do is to try new things. They had to pivot because their original markets had disappeared. I mean, farmers markets weren't allowed to open. Um, their wholesale markets completely dried up. Restaurants, institutions all shut down last year and farmers had food planned, growing, ready to go. And so they found ways to do it. Um, there are lots of options. I kind of focused on the Northeast ones right now, but we can help get resources for other areas. Um, Coastal Food Shed, which run, runs the farmer's markets in New Bedford, um, also has a pick order online for pickup and they have a delivery option as well, uh, working with what's good. Uh, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. What's Good has a wider range and works with more farms than Coastal Food Shed, but they have easy online orders. Um, you can either prepay and have it delivered to you, or you can order online and pick right up in New Bedford. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. Um, so then there is Farm Fresh Rhode Island, which has Market Mobile, also does a delivery program. Um, Market Today, INSA works a little bit differently, um, but also serves, you know, with the buying on buying online and delivering through Metro Boston, the South Shore, and Metro West. There, as you get further west, there are other or there are other organizations doing 
similar types of work. And we'll get some more links to you. Uh, locally Skinny Dip Farm, you can order online and pick up the, fa the farm, which is over in Little Compton. Skinny Dip is one of the farms that uh, does accept food incent uh, nutrition incentive program um, options. So if you are a customer on food stamps, SNAP, or have access through Massachusetts Healthy Incentives Program, you can use your benefits at Skinny Dip Farm and be able to uh, buy your food and use your benefits directly at the farm. Okay, next slide. Oh, good. Yes, that's right. Heartbeats is doing. That's right. I'd forgotten they were doing online ordering. Um, so CMAP in our job is to talk more about local food um, with the consumers, you know, in events like this, we put out a local food guide. Most of so these this map in the lower left are the um, are the um, by locals from Massachusetts. So each of those organizations has a website um, and will help you find local food in your region. Um, CMAP also puts out a newsletter called The Vine and it comes out monthly and it's events and happenings and farm promotion for uh, mostly southeastern Massachusetts. We do a quarterly or so uh, paper newsletter also that talks a little more in depth on topics in about local food and then um, just put up our website if people are interested. And next slide. There we go. A little faster than I did it before. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, yeah, we have a chance to uh, ask questions and see what is your interests are in local food. Karen, thank you. That was really informative. And I hope, I know not everyone is obviously from, from the area, but hopefully those who are learn something I, I did. And if you're farther away or whatnot, hopefully you also, uh, your wheels are turning now as to what you might do and where you might go. Yeah. Um, a question uh, I had um, was, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, farmers markets. Um, and this comes up a lot, even, you know, talking with my mom recently, um, you know, or finding a CSA. Um, but let's, let's stick with farmer markets for a minute. If there are not farmers markets nearby, you know, how, how does a group get together and decide to offer that to their community? I mean, how do farmer market, farmers markets come about? Um, a couple different ways. Um, and it's, it's an interesting, you know, 10 years ago, it was a little easier to start a farmer's market. I would say now you really want to be proactive in understanding your community and getting community support. So the farmer's markets can be started by anybody, by an individual community member, an organization. Sometimes a farmer will start it. He'll see, you know, there's a hole, there's a potential market and a farmer's market might work. Um, markets do need a business structure. You are handling money in most cases. Um, so you want to find somebody to help you do that yourself or work under another organization. Uh, sometimes a church will help sponsor a farmer's market or a community, you know, community organization. Um, and that will give you the chance to, you'll need things like insurance and a location. Um, so, you know, you want to get your business, think about how you want to do your business structure. You want to reach out to the community. Um, it, you know, I can't say enough. You have to have the community behind you to, to attract the farmers and to build a strong market. Um, you might want to, you know, do just do some surveying of the businesses and what they think would be useful in the region. Um, we had a farmer's market in Falmouth and it fell apart that 25 years ago and it, about 10 years ago, we started it up again and worked with our local communities um, and the businesses in the region to help develop a strong market. You know, we did it in our downtown region where there were already a lot of local businesses. So we chose not to, in our market, offer anything but local fruits and vegetables um, and simple value added, you know, um, that came directly from the farm. There was no health and beauty aids. There was no, you know, um, nothing that would be a potential competition for downtown. And that worked in our situation. Other places like um, the SOAM, the open air market, they're everything, you know, they're soup to nuts, everything from, um, 
goodness, I can't even, you know, um, arts and crafts to value added to, um, to, to farmers as well. And so it just depends on your region and you want to be open-minded and, you know, about careful about what the region needs. Um, you know, Canton is one of the new um, locations for a farmer's market, and they've been working with CMAP for the past three months, just, you know, looking at what it takes to start a market, helping, we help them make connections, we did some outreach to the farmers for them, because the other thing you're going to need is really at least one anchor farm, one farm that has a wide diversity of um, offerings so that it will bring people to the market. Um, and, you know, it, with one good farm, you can get by and it's good to have two or three. Um, you want to be able to bring in your local farmers as well. Um, and, you know, so anyone who's in Southeastern Mass or even on the fringes, we can help connect you to your, the organizations that you need. Um, there's Mass Farmers Markets in our region who help start markets as well. Um, and I will just, you know, not to ever down, how do I say I don't want to, you know, discourage people, but market saturation in farmers markets, especially in the summer, is real. And what we are starting to find is you can start a new farmers market and you will get customers, but what you will do is you will bleed from other markets into that market. So the, there's not necessarily a net growth of income to the farmer. And to make the same amount of money, they now have to go to two farmers markets. Um, and that comes with additional costs for the farmers. And so that's been the biggest barrier sometimes to getting a new market is the farmers just feel like, all right, they're doing well enough in, in this region and that the market can't take anymore. They're going home with product. So um, back to the original, you know, community support is crucial and making sure that you have the, um, the base to create a successful market. Thank you, that was really thorough. And I see that people are adding some information about markets maybe closer to them. Um, and so if there's any opportunity for people to learn from that, that's appreciated. Uh, yeah. A couple really good questions. And just because I am, I think that this last one may have come from something you just said. Um, Nina asked if you could please explain what value added covers. Oh yeah, so it can, so a value added product has somewhat of a technical term, but it's, it, you know, it would be something like kimchi or tomato sauce or, um, boy, you know, my brain is applesauce, you know, where there is a farm product, but it, it has been processed some way to both preserve it for off-season sale as well as to add some value to that actual product by the farm, usually by the farmer's labor. Awesome. And then there was a question um, from Lenny and I don't want to overlook it. It was a really great one. Uh, and Karen, I'll kind of lean into your experiences to guide us here, but it was about like, what would you ask a farmer? You know, if you wanted full transparency, you wanted to know about the health of the food you're eating, what are some questions you might ask? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, because yeah, you want to be respectful that the farmer, you know, my experience has been farmers know what works best on their farm. Um, and there are farmers who were certified organic and who were finding that um, there, so there's, it's just a very, it's a very technical response, but it's, uh, you know, I'll use it as an example that a quick acting nitrogen, which is not nitrogen fertilizer, which is not part of the organic standards was actually really helpful, even in a nutrient dense um, it, growing conditions. And so they were willing to step away from the organic to get the benefit to the crops and the benefit to the people. Um, and so you would want to ask how, what kind of fertilizers they're using, um, how they're, um, how they're treating their, you know, what do they do if they have a pest infestation? Um, you know, how do they feel about using, um, using um, herbicides and pesticides? You know, and there are some really good times and good reasons to use a pesticide or herbicide um, and ask them if they're using integrated pest management. So looking to balance, you know, natural cycles by using some, you know, a ladybug to eat aphids is probably the most common example you would see. Um, and then, you know, really listen to why they're doing it. Um, there are always going to be farmers who see that question as a challenge, but, you um, if you are asking and willing to listen to the answer and understand the answer. Um, 
and that's sometimes the hard part is having a, you know, being able to have a farmer explain it to you. We're also happy to talk through growing practices. And if there's a particular growing practice you're concerned about, um, you know, to help develop a particular question, I, you know, I'm having a little bit of trouble coming up with any scenario that might, you know, need an answer, but, um, there are very few farms I would not, I would say, is there any farm I would not buy from? I don't think so in our region. They're really doing a good job with land care and plant management. I, I, I just want to chime in here because I yeah. think it's such an important question. And, and I think, um, Lenny, you asked it and you're, you're coming in from California, so different from the farm around here. And it's so easy for you, Karen, to like know some of the answers to those questions yeah. where the, you know, some of us on the call would be like, they could tell me any type of fer fertilizer that they use. And I'd be like, okay, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, if there were just a few like, you know, key terms like IPM, in in mm -hmm. um, integrated pest management is a great one. Uh, restorative agriculture. Like if you and I could just like, what are like the five like terms that you would want to hear them say yep. that the lay person, you know, could say, okay, like, that that sounds good versus you know knowing like what kind of fertilizer or what kind of because even I mean there are some herbicides and pesticides right that are organic that they could be yeah. using that you know if you hear that you might say okay that's bad so I just if you could just yeah. give like names like five names of five words that they could say that you could say okay that that sounds yep. pretty good they're they're yeah. like yeah, I mean, restore. If anyone's talking about restorative agriculture, you're certainly well on the way to having a farmer who's got a whole systems approach to their farm. Um, you would want to hear that they are using um, organic fertilizers. There's not, you know, for the most part, um, you would want them to be using plant-based herbicides and pesticides um, for the most part, you know, it is a very technical topic. What is, um, organic and not organic. Um, that's good. Yeah. So, yeah. And Patty just, I don't, can't tell if Patty, I don't know if you just shared that with the group, but Patty just fed me as well. Uh, a really great blog, 10 important questions to ask your farmer at the market. Patty, oh, yeah. it'd be great to share it. She goes, there we um, go. But, uh, I think, you know, what, what you're saying, Karen, that resonates with me is like, you know, even just thinking about um, all the conversation about healthy eating we've been having through the challenge is to, to appreciate that as much as I know, which is about this much, there's infinitely so much I don't know. And I think it, what you highlight is the importance of just listening mm -hmm. to the farmer and just being open to the questions because you can't come in presuming to have all the answers or to even know what the right answer is per se. But I think if you go in, and just can have those genuine questions uh, in your conversations. You know, there's a lot to be learned. And there's a, there's a lot of really cool wisdom on farms uh, to be shared, certainly. And we couldn't cover it all if we wanted to. Yeah. Um, I did have a question about um, GMO seeds. Oh, Patty was asking if you could uh, speak with those. And then, so I don't forget, because this scroll bar is not my friend. Uh, Lenny had also asked, is the government or USDA supportive of organic and or farm markets? So that's two questions. Why don't we take the one about support for organic and farm and then talk more about maybe some GMO seeds and things. Yeah, so um, yeah, the USDA is to some extent supporting um, organic in the sense that they will support small farmers. You can apply to have the fees waived or removed. Um, Government overall, yeah, you know, the USDA considers it a necessary evil, I think, honestly, to face organic. It's not, um, and that just comes from the the whole, I guess, you know, one of the conversations that we could have started with or could go into is the food system's broken. I mean, that is the, the base fact that a lot of these conversations come out of. Um, we support agro-industry, we support four or five crops at any scale with, you know, through the farm bill with incentives um, to grow just those crops. And what we get out of that is cheap carbohydrates, cheap fats that are not necessarily as nutritious. Um, and they consider fruits and vegetables specialty crops. Um, and, and, on, and then even 
I will say lower on the food chain for them is organic. Um, the people wanted organic. Uh, they considered it as a marketing term um, and wanted to have control of what was in that. A lot of times so that, you know, going back to that spaghetti graph of agro industry corporations that wanted access to that market. Uh, the USDA jumped into that. So their support comes with um, strings. I think if you want to find a supportive um, <laughs> um, group that was supporting agriculture, organic farming and agriculture, you go to someplace like the Northeast Organic Farmers Association. Um, you know, they are looking at supporting small farmers. Um, does the USDA support farm markets? So there are programs, marketing programs within the USDA that um, CMAP has uh, several grants we work through to help promote um, local farms in Massachusetts. And they do consider um, small farms to be part of agriculture. They just don't get as much attention as the big, um, you know, big agro industry does. So. Awesome. Thank yeah, that answer your question? Yeah, very much. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, GMOs, there's the sometimes the elephant in the living room. So for most small farmers, G, they don't even look at GMO seeds. Um, so they're not as big on my radar as, you know, some of the other issues that face farmers, like, you know, labor and insurance and stress, the farmer stress and things like that. But um, there are some crops that, you know, for human consumption, it's, it's getting more and more prevalent, but it's just not something we see as much of. So, and genetically modified has, you know, we genetically modify seeds all the time, um, just by the choices we make in breeding. But the work that's being done to kind of break into the DNA of seeds, that type of genetically modifying, we're not seeing in small farm culture right now. So it is less of a concern for anyone who was buying from a farmer's market. You would not really see GMO products that or GMO seeds being used at that scale. Um, What's happening at the large scale, you know, there's a lot more of it. And it is, you know, they talk, there's a lot of really great talk about, you know, the vitamin A in rice and how that's going to help with vision across the world. And all of those seeds have Terminator technology built into them. You are not just creating a minor, you are creating a minor health benefit. And, and my understanding is that's still fairly minor, um, but you are creating a, dependency on that seed for whether or not it's GMO for added ben nutrient benefits or genetically modified to withstand higher herbicide applications. Um, you're creating an, a new business and that's the reason they've gone to GMO primarily is to create a business model that is more lucrative for large-scale agro industry. So, yeah, I feel like we're going right back to the, the larger conversation that we're not having necessarily. Right. Well, and we can have it too. I mean, you know, we, the U.S. pays between what, eight and 10% of its budget uh, and a consumer, an average um, American on their, on food. And that is the lowest amount, I think the lowest amount in the world right now for what we're paying of our budget toward food. Our food costs are just a minor part of our budget. And at the same time, there's a lot of money in agro industry. So it's a really funny dichotomy. But you know, Europeans are more like 15 to 20% of their budget goes to food. Um, and that comes you know, with just lots of issues around land care. And you know, th there is a drive to the bottom with that kind of th thinking of cheap food that you know, affects labor and land care and farmer health and choices around pesticides and herbicides and GMOs, so. Yeah, I think it does lend to a, a cool question though to talk to local farmers about as we're talking about not just the food product we're eating, but about the process. I know, you know, around the bend uh, locally, uh, I'm talking to Nate there, they, they're working very hard to protect some heritage uh, varieties um, through seed saving practices. And if you're not familiar with seed saving, that's, you know, it's another path we could wander down. Um, but it's a really cool thing. Uh, and, and I know, you know, our 
colleagues in uh, the grow education team are talking right now with New Bedford schools about seed saving practice yeah. and ways that students even can take part in that through the classroom or at home. So it is interesting to think about, you know, um, small ways we can kind of recapture uh, our agency over what is planted and what, what we consume, so. Well put, Katie, yeah. Um, there's a really good question here from Jane uh, that she's noting a farm near her uses wax to preserve, and she's asking if that's safe or whether it washes off. So wax is usually, especially at the small scale, is usually fine. It's usually carnauba wax, which is, I believe, like insect chitin. Um, and it's been super helpful in preserving produce, delicate produce. Um, you know, it's probably on, um, you know, they'll do it on anything from apples to sometimes turnips just to be able to keep them from shriveling up or beet. And yeah, it washes off, you know, it doesn't hurt ever to wash, you know, root crops and fruits with, you know, some safe soap and water when you get it home if you're concerned about it wax you want to have come off it is considered food safe to eat it can't go on the food if you don't um but it's also not you know it's not something you necessarily want to have in your body i've not ever heard that there's been a particular issue with it okay uh, i appreciate that um uh Lenny saying she has a great short story about why we want organic. I, I'd be game. I'd be game. Yeah. Um, about, it must be 20 years ago, I was reading an article from someone and they were saying it was like in the Midwest and there was a dairy farm where they kept finding that the farm, that the cows in the dairy farm were licking the uh, whitewash in the, um, in their, in their little shed. Uh, where they would be milked and they couldn't figure out what it was. And then they realized the whitewash had like calcium carbonate in it. And they were so starved for calcium because they weren't getting it in the foods that they were eating, that they were licking it off the walls. And it made such a, it fixed in my mind yeah. so clearly, you know, why we would want to eat organic. Yeah. And, and the issue of uh, depleted soils. Yeah, that's a big one. That's one we have not paid enough attention to in our science. Uh -huh. we're, we're digging up, I'm having Patty look up right now, the link to Zach Bush. So if any of you have not been watching or following Zach Bush, you should be. Oh. Um, and I say like should be like, and I don't say should easily, <laughs> but um, you should be because his he's a triple board certified three-time triple board certified doctor or something. And he has such a, a depth of knowledge around uh, GMO. So talking about yeah. GMO and GMO, GMO modified crops and then glyphosate and how that um, affects the shikame pathway, which is a pathway that's really important to our gut lining and our blood brain barrier oh. and how that it, it destroys that shikame pathway and it is creating porousness and therefore linking that to why we're seeing such an increase in autoimmune diseases and neurological diseases at younger and younger ages too. Yeah. Um, so Patty, I know is working that uh, to get that link for you all, but um, check out Zach Bush because he's yeah. really doing a lot of work with the farm through his organization called the Farmer's Footprint. Um, and, and it's really all about uh, restorative agriculture and the importance of nutrient rich soils, you know, and the food coming out of that. Um, so we'll, we'll get that information up for you soon. And stuff, you know, because one of the promising um, new techniques that um, has developed, been developed in the past 20 years is no-till farming. And it's been easy to implement at a large scale. No-till farming is where instead of turning over the soil every year, you um, usually are planting a cover crop that in turn you kill either, you know, so, and, and, and plant into it. And we'll talk about the kill part afterwards because that's where it gets interesting and concerning, but that keeps the soil covered. It keeps the soil protected. You aren't necessarily turning over the soil, losing organic matter, losing soil biodiversity, losing soil structure. It's really good used on a large scale. There's equipment for it and farmers are getting it, you know, in the Midwest. But at the same time, you know, you can go over that crop with something called a roller crimper, which kills the crop, or you go in with 
glyphosate and kill the crop. So, you know, and then you're in turn needing a plant that is more resistant to glyphosate. And so you're caught in a different cycle. We are working with farmers on the first pathway. You know, you're, you're putting, using your no-till equipment, you're, you know, you're killing with a roller crimper and you're planting in with a no-till planter. And that works really well um, for just improving your soil. But in the Midwest, we've been able to save topsoil, but it comes at the cost of that extra herbicide use. And so, you know, it goes back to that first question of, you know, or that, that base conversation of the scale at which we do agriculture and what that means. Yeah. And I think if, um, I it, no, it, in some ways, maybe a light touch, but if you haven't seen the documentary Kiss the Ground uh, and the conversation around soil health and, and that whole, you know, biology, that yeah. would be a, a reasonable place to, to start. And it is, it's compelling. Um, but you know what, uh, Lenny's story actually brought up another thought. And I think, um, Karen, I saw it somewhere else, maybe in one of your slides, is about um, animal product from farms and it's practices for animal care animal husbandry, the way animals are raised, treated, and then the way that as well, agri uh, agripreneurs are supported in getting animal products into the market. If, if you have any insight on that, I, I think we tend to talk about fruits and vegetables a lot. Yeah, um, but oh God, meat is so important. The grass-fed meat is just, the, I won't eat anything but really is what it comes down to. There's no point in not, for the animal's health, for your own health, for the planet's health. Um, meat itself, is still um, requires more inputs than plant-based material for the amount of nutrition you get, but it's also crucial nutrients that come out of meat, you know, out of livestock products. So you want to have grass-fed meat in your diet um, if you're eating meat. Um, and organic is a different, different kettle of fish, different kettle of uh, beef stew with um, what inputs are there. I mean, farmers have one set of concerns. Um, there are different concerns with livestock farmers. Uh, and in some instances, you know, the good farmer is, if they're not organic, they are using only in a last case scenario to save an animal's life. Um, they are breaking an organic standard. And that's really what you want. You want a farmer that is looking at the whole nutrition of the animal, that it gets good care right up until, you know, it is in the kill pen and ready to be harvested. Um, there's just a very, you know, farmers, even before they looked at animal, animal care or, an, you know, the, the life, uh, the quality of life of the animal, just understand an animal that is slaughtered under stress has poorer quality meat than an animal that is not stressed at death. So um, there's reasoning just from, you know, the far, that's where the farmers started. And then they, I think more people have become, come to realize that, you know, the service that the animals are doing for us in that process of, you know, they give their life for us. So we actually have life. Um, and a good farmer respects that life cycle and that process. Um, we're lucky to have a new slaughter facility in our region that pays much more attention to that than any of the other uh, local slaughterhouses processing plants. Um, for those of you who, oh my goodness, I am not able to come up with her name. The, um, uh, the woman who is autistic, who is also the animal vet. Um, uh, Grand Temple, Grand Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin actually helped them design that facility. I watched her look at their designs and think about it from the animal's perspective and the changes that they made to that facility to make sure it was the best facility possible. Yeah. And now they're so oversubscribed <laughs> that it takes a while to actually, you actually have to get a slaughter date before you can get your animals. Um, to make sure you can get them when you want them. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. And I think by extension, you know, the one we've, we've talked a lot about CSAs and farmers markets. Um, I know the cool thing that I see um, in, in whatever way I'm, I'm buying food locally as well is, is um, you know, bakers, restaurants, purchasing um, local, which is, is another yeah. really cool thing and paying attention to where they're sourcing their foods from, whether dairy or um, produce meats and things. And I think that's another way we can kind of care for that whole local ecosystem. Yeah, I think no matter where we are, there are ways that we can support our local farmers and our local producers. I mean, the first one is, you know, go through that, find where you can buy from your farmer. Um, but you can also, you know, just simple things like eating seasonally, knowing what's in season and buying direct from the farmer, planning your menus based on seasonal eating, 
Um, there's a lot of great resources out there for that. We can, you know, I can come up with a few for Katie and for, you know, maybe get them into the Facebook group. If you're not in that Facebook group, um, you know, we can share some resources there. Um, start your shopping at the farmer's market. You know, so you, you know, you go to the farmer's market, you find, you might find something you didn't expect, but then you can build your menu around that. Um, and then when you are at the grocery store, when you're at the corner market, when you're at a restaurant, ask what's local. You know, when businesses hear that people are interested in local, you know, the more they hear that, the more they are likely to buy. And that's a great way to support, you know, wherever you are, just being able to um, bring, you know, bring your farmer into everybody's consciousness. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, Patty is on this call, uh, Rigo from the Marion Institute, Patty is the queen of marketing in my world. She yeah. does a really bomb job of not just promoting the Marion Institute, but she promotes a lot of our partners. Yep, there she is. Hey. Love you, Patty. And, uh, and, you know, I think that's really important too, is when you find something good, when you find someone who's doing the work and producing something valuable for the community, um, be a Patty, go, go promote them, post them, you know, somewhere, tell someone about it, encourage them to go to like you guys were doing in the chat box. I think that's that's also important is just keep spreading the message and helping connect other people with opportunities, you know, to play part in, in their backyard, you know, what's happening there. So, I mean, from a show of hand, I don't know, a lot of people are on their phones, I know. Um, are, are most people able to find local food in their communities or are there areas where they're not able to find local food? Yeah, you do. that's good. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, I represent a small area, but I'm also, you know, geographically, but I'm also able to find, you know, connected to bigger networks that can help people find local food. And I'm happy to do that for anyone on this call. Yeah. I want you to find your farmers. <laughs> yeah, I think any of us will help. And I would be really remiss to overlook the fact that Liz and other of our colleagues at the Marion Institute have spent a lot of time trying to develop or they are, have developed a food finder app, which is currently yeah. online and being improved upon daily. Um, so for those of you who are local uh, to Southeast Mass, if you are looking for food or food resources or wondering how and where you can use your benefits, um, that uh, resource is now, Liz, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's now live on the MI website, right? Yeah, and any of us would always be helpful to get you connected. Uh, and again, if you know some, you know, these are pretty, uh, unique in trying times. If you know someone who's who's struggling and might benefit from having that resource, Patty just posted a link, um, pass it along. Uh, Cause certainly all of us need to eat and yeah. it's great to know, you know, how to diversify our food sources and, and where to go to find the right foods. Um, it is, I'm gonna caveat. So yeah, Food Finder is, as I just mentioned, it's, it's new, it is not perfect. If you do experience any sort of issues in using it or if you notice something is, you know, not fluid, uh, just let us know because then we can run that to the developer who's helping us work on this and we can you know, take the time to get it straightened out and working properly. So your input, if you do use it, is really helpful. Yeah, it's gr a great resource. Great. And I'm uh, trying to grab some of these links that I didn't know <laughs> in the chat, but I know that they'll get sent out afterwards as well. Any other questions? So oh, there's a new message at the bottom. Good. Yeah, if anybody if anybody didn't grab anything that was in the uh, the links, uh, we will be sending that out with maybe a copy of your slideshow. Sure. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you again to everyone for taking time out of your day to join us. It's always a lot of fun when you're here, and uh, when we can get your questions and your feedback. So thank you for, for doing this. And again, I'll hope that you might join us next Friday at the same time. Um, Julie Paquette of the Mindful Collaborative is going to be introducing a meditation for inquiry. That's not anything I've ever done. And if that interests you or interests someone you know, please join us for that. Um, but she'll be walking us through that practice. And then also don't forget on February 2nd, uh, we will be having a bio bite on the topic of sleep with Dr. Dr uh, Jeff Drobot from ACBM in Arizona. He's also affiliated with the Biomed Center uh, New England. Uh, and on the 5th of uh, that Friday, we'll be having an Ask the Doctor event with Dr. Dixon Tom, also from ACBM in the Biomed Center New England, uh, always at noon, always at lunchtime. So. Awesome. Well, Karen, thank you again. And thank you again for joining. I appreciate the Marion Institute putting it together and having the opportunity. Thanks. Yeah. Great, Karen. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you all. Nice, Monique. Good, good day, nice to meet everybody. you all. Thank you.